I want to thank Mint Mobile for partnering with me today. Go check out our partner at mintmobile.com backslash Stackers University to get premium wireless for as low as $15 a month. Make sure you switch today and start saving money without sacrificing quality. Thank you again to Mint Mobile for partnering with me today. For some reason, we seem to forget that in the metals market for every buyer, there is a seller. Just like low supply leads to higher demand and prices, more buyers than seller leads to higher prices as well. Over the weekend, the good old internet lit up when the news came out that BlackRock purchased 10.8 million shares of Sprott's Physical Silver Trust, most notably known as PSLV. And of course, this led to all kinds of speculation as it relates to how bullish this really is for silver prices and institutional investor money flows. Heck, there were even people speculating whether or not PSLV actually owns physical silver. I guess having physical silver in the name and government documents just isn't good enough for some. Or the fact that once an investor holds the equivalent dollar value of 10,000 ounces of LGD silver bars, they may redeem their units for physical silver. That aside, the real question is, what does this mean for silver? Is this bullish, bearish, or bullish? Well, we definitely know that this is not bear, so we can take that off the table. And to understand what this move really means, you kind of need to know a little bit about PSLV and understand how it works. As a closed-in fund, that means unlike SLV, it cannot actually create shares daily to match demand, meaning there are only so many shares on the market, which means by simple logic, in order for BlackRock to make the purchase, someone else had to be willing to sell or the shares had to be available. Another important point to make is that because it's a closed end fund, that doesn't mean BlackRock's purchase is going to directly translate to additional ounces being taken off the market. We frankly don't know that for certain, but based on my understanding of closed end funds, in the short term, it doesn't. If nothing else, we need more information to make that determination. This is so important to know because as Dr. Keith Weiner and Monetary Metals point out in their How Not to Think About Gold publication, this truly speaks to the quote, smart money or famous buyer fallacy as they stated. The size of the purchase and the notoriety of the buyer plays tricks on the average investor's mind, tilting it towards bullishness. In fact, it's a documented form of cognitive bias based on authority. I will link to that document and my interview with Dr. Keith Weiner in the description. As they suggest in that document, I encourage you to think about the transaction this way. Someone sold 10 million shares to BlackRock. If you think about it that way as well, it's a lot harder to determine who's the quote smart buyer or smart person or smart seller in this transaction. Remember 10 or 11 months ago when YouTube went nuts over the billionaire who spent $50 million on silver? Remember how hyped people were and they started telling you that this was the definite signal that things were about to change for silver and silver was going to be on the move? Yeah, remind me what happened to prices after she made her purchase? and all the hoopla faded, seems to me that she could have waited a several months and gotten a lot more silver for her money. Now don't get me wrong, this isn't about picking on this buyer. It's about what we decide to do or how we interpret that information. It seems to me that there was a famous buyer and there was also a seller. And clearly the seller got the better end of that deal. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not over here trying to play schlep rock from the Flintstones and be all doom and gloom because there's actually some good news here. Most people in the marketplace are not as smart as you folks are because they actually believe in the smart or the famous buyer's fallacy. Additionally, BlackRock does have a history of positioning itself in the right places at the right time, which means I do believe it will get some people's attention and it may even send a signal to other institutional and even retail buyers to think that BlackRock knows something that the rest of us just don't know. Regardless, we cannot forget for something to be purchased, someone else has to be selling it. And as I shared in my What Gold is Waiting For video, I firmly believe the last thing we are waiting for is money rotations from other sectors into gold and silver ETFs, as this chart shows that we are at the lowest levels in history. Let me know in the comments, do you think BlackRock's purchases are bullish or bullish for the price of metals? Or is this a nothing burger? As I see it, it does send a message to other institutional investors that metals are something they need to pay attention to. And if that is enough to start money rotation, then this will be bullish for metals. But until then, it's just slightly positive in my book. For the rest of our time together, I want to repost segments from a video I posted the other day that I had to take down because of some technical errors on my end. So if you will, please indulge me one more time, sit back and enjoy my take on how you can free up more money to counteract the impact of high premiums on your stacking budget. When you start by asking yourself, what can I do to nullify the impact that high premiums is having on me getting as much metal as I can for my money? That also subtle shift 
actually activates your brain and starts to help you find solutions to this problem. When we focus on solutions, we realize that one of the first things we can do is simply increase our stacking budget so that we can get more metal. Over on Discord a little while back, we started a monthly savings challenge. We'll be doing that again, so be on the lookout for that. But I will also share with you that I do this exercise around every six months or so. And the last time I did it, I freed up $500 a month, with it, which I did a video about, and I'll link to that video at the end. And I'm gonna use air quotes and say that I was only able to free up $300 by making some changes to how I spend my money, which means I now have another $300 for my stack budget and after this video I want you to go through a similar process and see how much you can redirect from one area of your life and reallocate that over to your stacking budget first I went through every credit card statement and bank statement line by line looking for fraudulent or reoccurring payments that I was not aware of and what did I find I found a $15 Amazon fee but me and Mrs. Stacker share an Amazon account and I'm on her account so why am I paying for this? I also found that my promotional discount on my XM radio had finally expired and I was back to paying the normal rate. After calling and threatening to cancel, I was given a new quote discount, which saved me another $12 a month. Next was a reoccurring donation that I was paying on an obscure credit card that I never used, so I canceled that $25 payment. I quickly freed up around $55 right there. If nothing else, that's at least enough to cover the increase we've seen on one ounce gold eagles. And if we're talking silver, that's enough to cover the increase in premiums and still give me an extra ounce of silver. While you do need to examine your discretionary spending, I'm not gonna go into that in this video. I'm gonna leave that to you. This time, instead, I focus on what I call pseudo non-discretionary expenses. Meaning these are the things that we think we need no matter what. So let's look, dig a little deeper into that and I'll share with you what I found. The first thing I explored was my dreaded cable bill. I dug deep and I asked myself, do I really need cable? I mean, most of the time we're watching streaming apps, YouTube, listening to music, or I'm working on a video. Any shows I watch, I can simply wait for them to show up on Hulu or some other app. So brace yourself. I actually got rid of cable and I saved myself $120 per month. I'm about six weeks into it and frankly, I don't even notice it that much. But while I was also on the phone canceling my cable, we looked into my internet and then we determined that I was at least two levels too high on my internet package. Not 100% sure what to do, I just split the difference. And I went down one level and I saved myself an additional $20 a month. And again, I have not noticed a bit of difference in speed. While this may be too dramatic for some, what I do know is $140 can definitely get me a few more ounces of silver a month. For those keeping tally, we're about $195 in already. Excuse me, folks, for this brief interruption, but I want to say thank you again to Mint Mobile for partnering with me today on this video. I want to encourage you all to go to the link at mintmobile.com backslash Stackers University to get premium wireless for as low as $15 a month. Make the switch today and start saving money while sacrificing quality, and I'll explain to you why. Next, I looked at my cell phone bill. I was paying more than $100 a month, which is ridiculous. I'm sure you've seen those hilarious commercials from Mint Mobile and the incredible savings they potentially offer. And if you're anything like me, I'm a little skeptical whenever a new company pops up, especially when in this case where Mint Mobile is boasting boldly about offering the nation's largest 5G network and doing so with plans starting at $15 a month, which was just a fraction of what I was paying. Well, last month, I took the leap and I jumped from my previous provider over to Mint Mobile. And I have to tell you, I have been incredibly happy and I have zero regrets. It took me less than 15 minutes to sign up online. I opted to use their digital or their eSIM card and then I was done. I waited for my phone line to transfer over, and of all the ways that I have found to save money, that had to be the easiest, and the amount of money that I saved, given the amount of time and effort, is insane. Of course, after being a little skeptical and letting me be the test case, Mrs. Stacker also switched over, and more importantly, she loves it, and I'm absolutely loving the amount of money that we're saving. I was so impressed that for the first time ever, I actually signed up for an affiliate link, because I feel strongly about encouraging people to switch from their carriers to Mint Mobile, because I truly hate these monopoly situations where like the cable companies, cell phone makers and the cell phone companies have taken advantage of us for years with their thousand dollar plus cell phones and monthly plans that cost way over a hundred dollars a month. This video is all about saving you that money and between getting rid of cable and switching to over to Mint Mobile, I've been able to redirect a huge chunk of cash every month towards my stacking budget. And it only got better when I added Mrs. Stacker's phone line. At any rate, 
If you're thinking about it, I encourage you to use the link in my description because switching might be one of the easiest ways to save money without having to sacrifice quality of service. And that's been my experience with them from the beginning. And if you're keeping tally, that's how I freed up more than $300 a month that we're going towards other places that now can go towards my stacking budget and reduce the impact the premiums have on my stack. Too often we focus on not making enough money when in fact, some of our greatest savings can be found by examining where we currently spend our money. Where the rubber meets the road is that premiums are out of control, but what is in our control is how we spend or save our money. So increasing premiums are like a bag of lemons, and I suggest you start squeezing those lemons and make some lemonades, or in our case, squeeze your budget so that you can get more medals for your dollars. Always stack smarter and never stop learning.